have never seen a gun that big. You have never even imagined one, a range of over 1,000 miles. So it could reach Tehran? Yeah. Cairo? Sure. And of course, Tel Aviv. Shoot out a hook and line and you could fish in the Mediterranean. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today I'm at the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum in Shiloh, Manitoba, having a look at some of the fascinating items they have in their bomb room, including this 155mm extended range full bore or ERFB artillery shell. Now, the engineering behind this is really cool and we'll get to that in just a second, but even more interesting is the story of the person who invented it, a now almost forgotten Canadian figure whom I have been obsessed with for years, named Dr. Gerald Vincent Bull. Now, Bull's story reads like something out of a spy thriller. It is such a huge and sprawling story with so many interesting twists and turns that I couldn't possibly do it justice in a short video like this one. So I'd highly recommend you read up on Dr. Bull. There are a number of very good books out there, including Wilderness of Mirrors, Arms and the Man, and Bullseye. And I have also linked to an excellent documentary on YouTube down in the description, so please check that out. In the meantime, I will try to give you a Cliff's Notes version of this amazing story. So Gerald Bull was born in 1928 in North Bay, Ontario, and he studied engineering at the University of Toronto, where he became the youngest student in that institution's history to graduate with a PhD at the age of only 22. Now, after graduating, he went to work with the Canadian Armaments Research and Development Establishment, or CARDI, at Valcartier, Quebec, where he was assigned to the Velvet Glove Project, Canada's attempt to produce an indigenous radar-guided air-to-air missile for use on interceptor aircraft like the Avro Canada CF-100 Canuck and the ill-fated CF-105 Aero. Now, Bull's PhD dissertation had been in supersonic wind tunnels, so he was assigned to find the optimal shape for the Velvet Glove missile's outer casing. But he quickly ran into a problem, which was that the supersonic wind tunnels at the time were not very accurate, and this is because the shockwaves produced by the models would reflect off the walls of the tunnel and interfere with the results. But he quickly found an elegant solution. So one of the pieces of equipment that Cardi had left over from the Second World War was a tunnel for testing artillery shells, and the air in this tunnel could be pumped out to replicate the conditions at various altitudes. So what Bull did was to manufacture subscale models of the missile shape, put it in a sabot to allow it to fit inside of a larger artillery piece, and he fired these models down the tunnel, arranging paper screens at regular intervals so any deviations from the missile's intended course could be easily spotted. And this turned out to be a highly accurate and cost-effective method. After all, the missile was traveling through the air rather than the other way around, as it would be in real life, and this was soon adopted as standard practice at Cardi. And this experience sparked Bull's lifelong fascination with big guns and their possible alternate uses. And inspired by his favorite childhood book, Jules Verne's 1865 science fiction novel De la Terre à la Lune, or From the Earth to the Moon, he began dreaming of using large guns to launch satellites and other payloads into orbit for cheaper than conventional rockets. And he saw this as a means for Canada, with its smaller budget and industrial base, to make a useful contribution to the nascent space race. But nobody at Cardi was interested in these ideas, and following the cancellation of the Velvet Glove project as well as the Arrow, he had a huge falling out with Cardi and ended up quitting in 1961. However, he soon found ready supporters in the form of McGill University in Montreal and the U.S. Army, which was desperate to maintain a toehold in the space age. And they came up with a project called HARP, High Altitude Research Project, which was based out of Barbados, where McGill University ran a meteorological research station. And the U.S. Army managed to get its hands on a pair of 16-inch surplus naval guns, which it trucked all the way to Barbados and set up on a vertical trunnion, allowing it to fire straight upwards. And they used this gun, which they nicknamed Betsy, to fire special projectiles known as martlets to altitudes of up to 66,000 meters or 215,000 feet, altitude records for gun launch projectiles that still stand to this day. And these martlets contained either acceleration-hardened radio transmitters or dispensers for chaff and smoke, which could be tracked visually or by radar in order to measure the speed of high-altitude winds. Indeed, most of the meteorological data we have for these high altitudes comes from the HARP project. 
and each of these shots costs only around $5,000, a fraction of the cost of using even a simple sounding rocket. Now, meteorological research was the official purpose of HART, but of course, Bull's ultimate aim was to develop the technology necessary to launch satellites and other payloads into orbit. But unfortunately, this never happened. See, Bull really hated bureaucracy and politicians, I can relate, and he made a lot of enemies in the Canadian political establishment, who all conspired to have Project HARP shut down in 1966. Now, once again, Bull landed on his feet, since a specific provision in the contract between himself and McGill University granted him the full rights and use of the 6,000-acre secondary research site at Highwater, Quebec, on the Vermont border. And in 1970, he turned this into a private firm known as Space Research Corporation, or SRC. Now, despite its name, SRC was actually in the arms business. And the company did a bunch of consulting work for various militaries around the world and developed products like conversion kits for increasing the accuracy and range of existing artillery systems. However, they came to be best known for two main products, one of which was the 155mm GC-45 howitzer. Now, a lot of sources will tell you that GC-45 stands for Gun Canada, but it actually stood for Gun Caliber 45 indicating that the barrel was 45 calibers, or internal barrel diameters long, a ratio that Bull calculated was optimal for long-range performance. And to go with the GC-45, he came up with a brand new type of artillery shell, the ERFB, like the one we have here. See, when Bull first entered the artillery field, he was shocked to discover how little development there had been in artillery design over the last hundred years. See, Shell designs from the 1960s, such as this M107 here, were nearly identical to shells designed all the way back in the 1850s with this iconic cylindrical ogival shape. Now, this shape is mainly dictated by internal ballistics, that is, the conditions inside the gun barrel. So that the shell flies straight and leaves the barrel in a straight line, it needs to balance, hence the need for this cylindrical shape. However, this is not very optimized for supersonic flight and for long-distance shooting. Secondly, if the barrel is rifled, then you need a soft band of metal called a driving band, which engages with the rifling and allows it to impart a stabilizing spin onto the shell. And the driving band needs to be placed on one of the balance points of the shell, where it creates additional parasitic drag. And finally, the base of the shell is flat in order for the propellant gases inside the barrel to impinge upon it. Unfortunately, this causes the flow of air over the shell to separate, creating a low-pressure region at the rear of the shell that produces additional drag, and all of this combines to make a shell that is not optimized for long-distance flight. Now, the traditional way of solving this problem was to produce a smaller shell encased in a discarding sabot, which could be fired out of the full-bore gun, but would develop a much higher velocity and thus higher range. However, this greatly reduced the effective amount of explosive that the shell could carry, so Bull set out to create a shell that would have extended range but maintain its full bore, hence the name Extended Range Full Bore, or ERFB. Now, Bull was a very analytical thinker, a very original thinker, and he decided to reinvent the artillery shell from the ground up. So the first thing he did was to give the shell a different shape with a much higher fineness ratio, which was optimized for supersonic flight. Now, this tended to destabilize the shell inside the barrel, so he added these nubs here to support the front of the shell and allow it to fly straight down the barrel. And these nubs also engage in the rifling in the barrel, allowing you to move the driving band to the rear and make it smaller so it will produce less drag. But this still leaves the problem of the wake drag of the low pressure area behind the shell. Now, a lot of shells, like these two here, have a slightly tapered rear section. This is called a boat tail, and this delays separation of the airflow and creates a smaller low-pressure region behind the shell, reducing drag. However, you can't take this to its logical extreme and just make a pointed rear surface because the air will eventually separate and you will end up with just as much drag as if you had a flat rear surface, but with a lot more weight at the back of the shell. So instead, Bull licensed a clever innovation that had been developed in the 1960s by the Swedish National Defense Research Institute known as Base Bleed. Now this consisted of a canister that was screwed onto the base of the shell which contained a chemical composition that, when activated, generated gas. 
Now, this wasn't enough gas to propel the shell. This wasn't a rocket assist device, but rather that gas filled the low pressure area behind the shell, reducing the drag and allowing the shell to fly further. Now, combined with the GC45, the ERFB shell offered performance that was far beyond anything in the NATO inventory at the time. For example, at the time, the maximum range of standard NATO 155mm artillery was less than 25 kilometers or 16 miles. The GC45, by contrast, could reach up to 39 kilometers using base bleed with little loss of accuracy, or up to 50 kilometers at the cost of significantly reduced accuracy. Give an even more specific example, when firing a standard NATO M107 shell, the GC45 could reach a maximum range of 17.8 kilometers with a circular error probable of 59 meters or 194 feet in range and 12 meters or 39 feet in line. Now, for those of you who don't speak artilleries, circular error probable is a measure of dispersion wherein half the shells in a salvo are expected to fall within a circle of a given diameter. In range refers to the dispersion along the flight path of the shell, while in line refers to the dispersion perpendicular to that path. In comparison, when firing a standard ERFB shell, the GC-45 could reach a range of 29 kilometers, but the circular error probable was 190 meters or 620 feet in range, and 42 meters or 138 feet in line, significantly greater. This made the system less useful for long-range precision strikes, but very effective for long-range bombardment and counter-battery work. Now, SRC's first major client for the ERFB was Israel, which purchased 50,000 of the shells in 1973 and used them quite effectively for counter-battery work against Lebanese long-range rocket artillery. Now, Bull assumed that the GC-45 and the ERFB would be world beaters and soon militaries across the world would be knocking at his door, but unfortunately this was not to be, mainly due to the not-made-here phenomenon, with most countries, including the United States, preferring to develop their own indigenous artillery systems. This relegated SRC to filling smaller orders for clients like Singapore and Thailand. And then along came South Africa. Now, at the time, South Africa was under UN arms embargo due to its apartheid regime, and SRC needed to use a lot of subterfuge in order to supply them with arms. So between 1978 and 1979, SRC secretly shipped South Africa 30,000 ERFB shells, as well as technical documentation for producing GC-45 howitzers through Antigua and Spain. And the South Africans used this data to produce two versions of the GC-45, a towed version known as the G-5, and a self-propelled version known as the G-6 Rhino. And they used these to great effect in the Angolan Civil War, mainly against Cuban long-range artillery. And they continued to produce ERFB shells under the designation M1 and M9. Unfortunately for Gerald Bull and SRC, however, the scheme was eventually uncovered by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and a number of investigative journalists, and in 1980, Bull was charged, tried, and convicted of armed smuggling and sentenced to six months in minimum security prison. Now, upon his release, he was extremely disillusioned and angry. He felt that he had been betrayed by the CIA, which originally brokered the South African deal and later hung him out to dry, and he fled North America and set up shop in Brussels, the arms dealing capital of the world. And he soon started working for a number of clients, including China, which produced a variant of the GC-45 known as the PLL-01, and the Austrian firm Wuscht Elpin, which produced a variant called the GHN-45 that was sold to a variety of clients. Yet despite his apparent success, Bull was a great engineer, but unfortunately an awful businessman, and clients soon discovered that through flattery and other tactics, they could easily talk him down to accepting a fee far less than what he was worth, so SRC was always in dire financial straits. And it is here that we come to the part of the story that most people are familiar with, because the next client that Bull started working for was the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein. Now, Saddam Hussein was obsessed with making Iraq a modern, technologically advanced nation, and he made Bull an offer he couldn't refuse. He wanted satellite launch capability and saw Bull's supergun concept as a cost-effective means of attaining it. And so... He told Bull that he would fund his supergun project under the codename Babylon in return for Bull designing long-range artillery for the Iraqi military, as well as extending the range of the Scud missiles that they also operated. And so Bull eagerly accepted this deal and started working on the Babylon gun, 
which had it been completed would have been absolutely enormous with a barrel length of 156 meters and a bore of one meter capable of launching a one ton payload into low earth orbit. Now, Almost immediately, Bull started receiving threats and warnings from the intelligence agencies of various nations, including Iran and Israel, two enemies of Iraq, and his apartment in Brussels kept being broken into as a warning. Now, it was often stated that these nations were worried that Iraq would use the Babylon supergun to launch nuclear weapons, but this really isn't true. Anybody with even a cursory knowledge of artillery would know that Babylon was basically useless as a weapon. It was fixed in place on the side of a mountain. It had no capability to traverse or elevate. It would have produced an enormous light and sound signature, making it very easy to find, and would have been destroyed by a simple airstrike. Instead, what they were worried about was the long-range Scud missiles, which would have allowed Iraq to threaten cities in Iran and Israel. But unfortunately, Bull didn't listen. He continued to work on the Babylon project, and finally, on March 22, 1990, as he was unlocking his apartment door in Brussels, an unknown assailant came up behind him and shot him five times in the back of the head and the back with a silenced pistol, killing him instantly. Soon after, British Customs seized the Project Babylon gun barrel segments, which were being manufactured by Sheffield Forge Masters, and the gun was never assembled or fired. And that, dear viewers, is an extremely abridged version of the extraordinary life and times of Dr. Gerald Bull. Again, this story is enormous. It has so many other fascinating details. I highly recommend that you check out the books I recommended or watch the documentary linked in the description. Now, I have been obsessed with Gerald Bull for years. I visited the former site of his high water laboratory in southern Quebec to see what was left. There wasn't actually very much left, but it was still cool. And I even wrote and produced a play on the life of Gerald Bull. And you can actually watch a performance of it on Vimeo. Again, linked in the description. Anyway, Thank you so much for watching, and thank you again to the Royal Canadian Artillery Museum for allowing me to poke around their collection and pull out really neat pieces like this one. I will see you next time on another video or look at yet more fascinating artillery pieces and weapons and other devices just like this. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.